Welcome, everybody, again to the Fixed Ops Mastermind. This is a We Are Week, women educating in automotive retention and excellence. I am joined this week by my co-host, Kaylee Filio, and our three terrific guests, Felicia Barr, Gretchen Seidel, and Melissa Marlatt. Thank you all for being here. This week is brought to you by our sponsor, Parts Edge. Your parts department is the backbone of your dealership and is responsible for nearly half of your total profits, according to NADA. Our system works within your DMS for a hybrid approach that combines the precision of automation with the nuanced decision-making of parts experts. Thank you, Parts Edge. And now we will get into the show. Our show is broken up into three segments. The first segment today is going to be Why Automotive? Why did everybody here choose automotive? Uh, segment two is going to be about working together um, as techs, leaders, partners, women and men inside the, the dealership realm. And segment three, which will close out our show, is how do we open this industry up to more women? And so with that, I turn it over to Kaylee Filio to get us started. Thank you. I'm super excited to be interviewing you guys. <laughs> this is fun. Um, and this is my first time co-hosting this show. So, um, and I think it's a couple of your guys' first times going live. So this is going to be fun. <laughs> we know you'll do amazing, Kaylee. We cannot wait. <laughs> you guys are going to do amazing too. And this is going to be fun. So um, we'll start with just what attracted you guys to the industry um, and just kind of go down the list. Um, so... Yeah, let's start with, um, ah, now my screen went away. <laughs> <That's Probably. crazy. laughs> start with Felicia. Let's go. Yeah, down the list. <laughs> All right. Hello, I'm Felicia, and I am a service director of the Patera Auto Group. What attracted me to the automotive industry, it honestly happened by chance. Um, I was 25 years old, didn't really know what I want to do with my life. I had a friend who was a general manager of a dealership and said, why don't you just do this part-time, be a service grader? And I guess what attracted me to stay was just the all the opportunities for advancement. Um, every day was different and it was fast paced and I really enjoyed that. Yeah, I could see that. The, there's so many opportunities. It's, it's yes. amazing. Yeah. What about you, Gretchen? Oh boy. Okay. So since we don't have a full hour to talk about what got me <laughs> in here, right? So bringing it down. So for me, officially, hi, Gretchen Seidel, um, automotive SME expert. I talk to all kinds of people on all types of things. But what attracted me to the industry, um, it's a weird story. So Dave, you and I are going to have a moment with these other ladies will probably may not be able to understand. Um, I was a single mom and I needed a job that needed that had health insurance because I was waitressing. I was banquet waitress, waitressing, and I went to the newspaper. I opened up the newspaper and I circled an ad that said, title clerk needed, no experience necessary. <laughs> and it was at a Buick and Hyundai dealership. So like you, Felicia, I just kind of fell into it. I showed up at the dealership. Um, gentleman then, their general manager, talked to me for all of 45 seconds. And it is true, no experience was needed hired me on the spot, took me back to the office, introduced me to the comptroller and said, hey, here's your new title clerk. 30 odd years later, I, I'm still here. I'm still here. Gretchen, how do you how do you circle an ad on your phone? I know, right? And it's like, when I tell people that, I'm like, oh yeah, it was in the newspaper. Like you <laughs> used to get a Sharpie and you'd circle and then you'd get dressed and you'd show up at the place of employment. You'd introduce yourself. Yeah. Man, I may have just shown my age, Kaylee. <laughs> <laughs> That's okay. <laughs> it's changed so much now, though. Um, and we can get into that, like how how we can open it up more to get more women and, and how things have changed. But I mm -hmm. want to hear about Melissa. Yeah, mine was by chance, too. I was working in the mortgage industry, and then 2008 happened, and I found myself looking for a job. I just happened to know someone who was working for IntelliCheck. And so just as a get me by till I found something permanent, I started making phone calls for them. And that something semi-permanent stayed to permanent. So 16 years later, here I am. <laughs> and I kind of just kept making my way up in the company. And it was just, it's home for me. It, it was an instant fit. 
I went from not knowing anything about the automotive industry. I barely knew anything about the car I was driving to now I feel like I'm a service expert. <laughs> I, I feel like I feel like the industry should be called the, the by accident industry. Yeah, yeah. It's no, nobody. I I don't think anybody intentionally chooses automotive. <laughs> <laughs> so no, Dave. Fall I don't into think, it. Yeah, mm -hmm. especially no, women. I don't know if women intentionally choose automotive. As you can tell, mm -hmm. the three of us and you know, just we just fell into it. Yeah. <laughs> I fell into it too. I even tried to leave and I came back. So <laughs> yep, <same. laughs> yep, yeah. um, So I want to talk about some challenges as leaders in the industry. Um, what are some victories and some challenges that you guys have gone through um, since you've been in the industry? Um, and we'll go from the bottom up, maybe. <laughs> we'll start from the left up. Uh, challenges. Um, you know, I I've been very fortunate. I work for a small company and I've had a great boss through the years. So I haven't had many challenges as a woman and he, he led me to advance very quickly and he was a great mentor to me. Uh, as far as victories, I think just every day is a victory, right? Every deal we close, every deadline we make, we celebrate it. That's amazing. Mm -hmm. And what about you, Gretchen? Oh, challenges. Unfortunately for me, um, since it's been 30 odd years, the challenge list is very long, right? When you first get into the industry and everyone in the dealership, right? There, there are no females except from the accounting office. All the mm -hmm. females worked in the accounting office. So I was in accounting, but I didn't want to stay in accounting. I wanted to do other things. So it was difficult for me in the beginning of my career and very challenging to find women that were in actually sales positions or within the finance office. I wanted to be a finance manager. Like that was my love. So trying to find those types of women to be able to influence me and mentor me, huge challenge, huge yeah, challenge. I could see that. And yeah. I have one quick question too. What what about finance? What were you attracted to? Like I, I, I loved the art of the deal because back then it was calling, right? So you were calling your buyers, you were talking to customers, you were actually like really negotiating rate. Now this is before there was a two point cap, right? 200 basis points. You could put 600, 700 basis points on a contract, but we won't talk about that. That's for another conversation, right? But I loved the art of the deal, the actually pulling all the pieces together to help a customer get into a vehicle that they wanted. There was just something super just special about it. I, yeah, absolutely. Um, and Felicia, what about you? Is there any challenges and things that you, and victories? Um, yes. Yeah. So for the challenges, just right from the beginning, you know, I started off as a service greeter and I remember wanting to be a service advisor and really like pushing for it. And they would hire a lot of other people and I would watch them come in and leave and come in and leave. And then eventually I got the opportunity to be a service advisor. And, and I remember doing that for a while and wanting more. And I actually left the dealership. I've been at one dealership my whole career. So I've been here 11 years now, but I left for five months. And I remember leaving because I thought that they would never make me a manager. I'm never going to be able to grow and I don't want to be a service advisor forever. And I left and um, they asked me to come back. And when I came back, they made me the service manager. But I remember like having to really like fight and prove myself. And I don't know if it was more because I was a woman, because I was young at the time, but it was definitely a struggle. Um, but it all, it was worth it. It was and definitely actually, worth it. Yeah, it's totally worth it. You've been there 11 years and look at you now. Yeah. So and that's the victories. That's the victories. Time. That's the victories, you know. That's the victories. Um, being promoted and every day, you know, hitting the goals that they set for me and exceeding them. And that's like a, it's like a natural high that I love. Like, give me a goal and I'm going to, I want to get it and I want to beat it and I want to be the best at it. Um, yeah. Alicia also had the, the additional um, challenge of, of having to work with me at, at, yeah. at one point. At one oh. point. I want to hear about that. How was different, that? Different different stores, but same auto group for uh, yeah. five years. So yes, but um, honestly, I'm not just saying that because he's here. But he was one of the only. There was a couple of people that would help me. Other people just dismissed me, and Dave really helped me. You know, I consider him somebody that kind of 
always had my back and would just teach me. I could ask him any questions. He didn't make me feel stupid for asking them. And he was always just a good motivator for me. So thank you, Dave. It was great working with him. It was. Thank you, thank you for that. that. Well, she, she was, she was my driver because she, uh, she was the one who was providing the competition within the group. So. <laughs> yes, that's awesome. I was going to say, that's probably what you, what attracted you to that role is, you know, the challenge to like always do more and do better. I'm assuming. Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> yes, no, definitely. And to prove myself, you know, like I can do this, you know, I think seeing no women, right. They're just in the office working in accounting. I was scared, but I was like, you know what? I can do this. And I had people telling me like, you can do this. It doesn't matter. Like your experience, you just got to keep trying. And I just kept trying and I kept learning and and I developed a very thick skin, um, but it all worked itself out. Yeah, it's Kaylee. Do, do you mind if I tag on something with Felicia? Yeah, go right ahead. Go uh, for it. Felicia, I love that you shared that story because the similarities with a lot of women. So when I was in the accounting office, right, like you're in the service drive as a greeter, you want to become an advisor. I want to go into finance and the barrier that you had to get through the challenge to actually get to there. And just to add to that, that our careers are a little bit further apart, but yet almost the same. I actually had to start selling cars. I would, on Saturdays, I would greet customers too, right? In the sales department, I'd go to sell cars, but I could only deliver them after five o'clock during the week because I was in the accounting office and pushing to prove myself that like, hey, I can do this as I had a full time mm -hmm. job in the accounting office as the title clerk and then accounts receivable. But then after five o'clock, I was allowed to deliver my customers or I could split the deal. Yeah. So it's very interesting. <laughs> I thank you for sharing because that reminded me of my journey and then how alike they are, even though we're further apart, you know, in our careers where we are. Yeah. That's so interesting. It is. Yeah. The, the, uh, the, the first time, and, and this is, I, I, I've, I've said this before, that, that I'm, uh, I'll attach the word shame to it, but um, ashamed that, that this never dawned on me before. Um, but Kerry Wise uh, from Wokan had said to me in, in an interview that there, there were no mentors that looked like me, right? And, mm -hmm. and as, as, a, as a, a, a white male, that yeah. never dawned on me. I had I had mentors everywhere in the dealership, right? Yeah. Everybody was. And you guys didn't have that. You, you yeah. didn't have that advantage of yeah. you maybe had people who were there willing to help you and mentor you, but nobody that that could completely understand where you were coming from uh, and, and the struggle that was different from uh, uh, having to overcome some things that that a bunch of the men in the dealership didn't have to overcome. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And we're talking several, several years ago, but do you feel like we're still dealing with that and going through these types of things as females in dealerships? <laughs> Just not. Okay. Okay. I don't want to talk. Advice. I'm like, yeah, maybe. What <laughs> advice do we give um, women that are coming into the industry um, on, you know, obviously the challenge is the, the fuel, but, you know, it shouldn't be as hard for us too, in a way. Right. So, yeah. What advice? I think it's give? getting better than when I first started. Um, you know, I have a counter and I have, you know, female advisors. So I, you see more female advisors. I see we have female salespeople, but I think it's all in the ownership too. You know, my owner, he gave me that opportunity. He believed in me, you know, in a sense, he stuck his neck out for me in hopes, you know, that it would, uh, work out, which it did, they, you know, um, and so did my fix ops director. So I think it all depends on who's like above and if they can eventually change the way they think. And I think a lot of people are changing. I don't know, you know, I'm in New England, so I feel like it's diff maybe different than other places. I'm not sure. That's true. Yeah. That male alley ship, right? Like, like Dave was talking, you know, you're talking about Dave Felicia and the way, you know, he, was a, a, a person for you and then getting a chance, but now you're in the position, you can build that team of women, right? Kaylee, to that point of, you know, creating that atmosphere moving forward. Yeah. yeah. And what do you do if you find yourself in a dealership that the leadership is, you know, the barrier and not, you know, you could do, you could leave, <laughs> but we don't want, we don't want people to leave and completely get out of the industry. 
too. So um, let's see, what about, oh, what about the favorite part of the industry? Do we have any, what's your favorite thing about the industry? We'll start with Melissa. <laughs> Uh, well, me being on the, the corporate side of things and the vendor side, I think sales has been my favorite thing, interacting with clients and hearing what they're trying to accomplish and building programs to meet their needs. You know, every every time I speak to a client, it's something different because it's an ever changing industry. So that seems to be my favorite part is getting into the sales. I don't get to do the dealership one-on-one -on -one as much, um, but it, that's a corporate side. That's my favorite. Yeah. Yeah. I would say that's my favorite too. Is it? Yeah. 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 Well, yeah. I'm more on the vendor side too. Well, I am on the vendor side. Um, okay. It's Gretchen. getting creative, right? You have to get creative listening yeah. to what they're mm -hmm. trying to do and what they need. And it doesn't always fit what our standard is. And so we have to get creative every day to build stuff around what they mm -hmm. want. Absolutely. And if you think about just the overall, there's just so much being thrown at a, at someone running a dealership or a service department or parts department where, yeah, they're running a thousand miles. How yeah. do you say that? A thousand miles a minute or however you, yeah. you know what I'm trying to say. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, Gretchen, what's your favorite part about the industry? As I've been racing through my head, I'm like, okay, OEM right? Dealership, TPA, direct agency model. Like what is, I'm like, Ooh, we might have to segment down to like a specific. Cause like in a dealership, I love retail. And so share a quick story. Um, just yesterday I was having a conversation with a friend of mine who is not in retail anymore, such as I'm not either. However, I'm visiting a store next week for two days and I cannot wait because my favorite part of a dealership, right? In the industry is waking up with the dealership. You know, like the sales guys come in at like, you know, what, 8.30, quarter to nine, they have their meeting, but everything's real quiet unless you get to the service drive. So you got to mm -hmm. be on the service drive like 6.30, 6.45 in the morning, you get your coffee. And my favorite part of a retail dealership is watching the dealership wake up. So um, next time I'm in Massachusetts, I think I'm going to go see Felicia and I'm going to go, you know, open up the dealership with her so I can just sit with my coffee and just like, Feel the energy come off the drive because that is the best. That's the best. Well, that that is, it, it's quite a dealership to wake up because she is. Uh, <laughs> You're she welcome has anytime. Operation. I, I, I'm going to tell you, my, I have, uh, my daughter lives in the DC area. So it's only a just short jaunt get to get to Massachusetts. <laughs> mm -hmm. And you painted such a like beautiful picture like the story of that is just like i'm like i want to go and do that every day <laughs> we're all coming to see you Felicia. <laughs> you guys are welcome to come <laughs> um, so hey dave um you're gonna put together like some sort of program for felicia melissa and i you know to get together with kaylee and we'll bring the baby and we're gonna go to massachusetts right yeah we we are on the road okay go. <laughs> perfect yeah and I can put him on my lap. I don't have to buy a ticket for him on the plane. So he's still I'll, 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 I can hold him. It's okay. Don't worry. About <laughs> you, you, and you guys got to find somewhere for Felicia to go so she can get away. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I have three kids. I'm over in, I'm close to Sedona. That's a great place to go visit. Oh, I would love to. Yeah. Yes. I, yeah. I'm down for that. Yeah. Right. Felicia, um, how about you? Your, your favorite yeah. part? I would say my favorite part, it's changed. I used to love like when a customer was upset and like, you know, the advisor was like, oh, they're so mad. I need you to talk to them. And I would love going over and being able to like diffuse the situation, like from him, the customer yelling at me to them leaving, laughing and, you know, thanking me for helping them. Um, so definitely helping people. But it's kind of changed now more to watching my employees grow. So I work with a lot of students from co-ops, so watching them graduate high school to then, you know, becoming employees here full time and watching them get, you know, get their toolbox, you know, get apartments, get houses, have kids. So watching people create a career here and knowing that I've been a part of it, I love that. It's just one of the best feelings, I think, and my favorite part of my job and managing people because it's not always the easiest, but that gives me the joy and keeps me wanting to wake up in the morning and come to work. Yeah, that, that's one of the greatest things is, is when you when you've moved to that point in your career where you now get to help others progress in, in their careers and, and see them from 
coming in as as the the green kids that you know don't know the difference between a, 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 an oil change and an air yeah. filter to, to now <laughs> oh, yeah. having your own families and they've moved up into service advisor roles or manager roles and things mm -hmm. that's that's an amazing feeling yeah yeah um, so would you say now's the time for the quote in the stat of the week, Dave? Certainly. Whichever one you'd like to do, you call it out. What? I have to do it? I thought you were doing it. No, you don't <laughs> tell me which one. You want a quote or you want a stat? I want a quote. <laughs> All right. The quote of the week is brought to you by Parts Edge. And it is failure is not fatal. The ability to learn from what it is, what it is makes a difference. And that is from Anjali Kumari. Again, Parts Edge bringing you the quote of the week. And that takes us into segment two, which was working together from techs and leaders uh, working together from the, the, the partners, Kaylee, Melissa, uh, Gretchen side of the business, uh, working with dealerships and men and women working together within the dealership and, and within that that partner dealership uh, re relationship. And when I say partner, it's vendor, but we prefer partner um, as, as opposed to vendor. So just so everybody understands that. <laughs> Haley, back to you. I love, I love how you pointed that out. It's a partnership. <laughs> Trusted partner. Trusted, Trusted partner. There you go. I love it. Um, okay. So then let's focus on, you know, servicing the customers, you know, where, where's the industry lacking? Um, both in male and female. So um, what are some areas that we could be working on and we're lacking in servicing our customers? And so let's start with Gretchen. We'll go in the middle. <laughs> All right. So where are we lacking? The first thing that pops into my head, Kaylee, it's personalization and communication. We in the industry have a really hard time communicating with our customers, not only in a transparent way, but in a timely way in all facets of the dealership, between variable, between fixed operations, we have to do better as it pertains to our communication because we lose people. We do. Yeah. Um, would you, well, let's go to, I have questions, yeah. but let's go down the list. <laughs> yeah. Melissa, what about you? Where are we uh, lacking in service? I'm going to have to go with, you know, my expertise is pricing transparency because pricing transparency, you know, builds trust in your customers, especially when it comes to servicing women, right? Because women are intimidated going into a dealer mm -hmm. and, or any repair shop. It's been known that we have been, um, I, myself, I've taken my car to be serviced and I have been quoted obscene amounts of money for services I know my vehicle doesn't need because they really thought that I was going to fall for that. Uh, so if I was able to go online and see what their prices are, uh, I would know I'm not being being won over to buy them just because I'm a woman. So I think transparency in your pricing is, is one of the key things, especially when you're servicing women. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Pricing is huge, especially, mm -hmm. yeah, with women. Yeah. Um, Felicia, what about you? Um, I would say consistency. So along with communication, uh, but I think the turnover in dealerships and with customers, they want to see the same people. They want to get the same service every time. And I see it. We get too busy. We don't update them. We don't do a video. We don't let them know what's going on or it's a different advisor because they left. So like with the turnover not being consistent enough, I think that's where customers feel like they're just going to go to a different dealer or they're going to go to a mom and pop shop because they feel like they're being taken advantage of or they don't really know what's going on because we're not consistent enough in our processes. Yeah, that's a good point. So yeah. communication, consistency, pricing. Um, I would like to add or question of just, you know, how do we meet the customers where they want to be met? Because I think there's so many different ways to communicate and um, ways to show the information with all of the technology that we have and just meeting them where they want to be met and not assuming they want to be delivered the certain ways that they want to be delivered the messages. <laughs> mm -hmm. So. Um, do I want to bring up social media because that's a huge, um, you know, that's huge right now. And so I think a lot of you guys are doing social media really well, podcasting, all of that. Um, so Felicia, I want to start with you and just talking about how 
you know, because I think you do a really good job with Facebook and Instagram um, about your dealership. So maybe any information that you could share for people that want to do more or, you know, how are you? How are you doing it all? Um, I don't know, but <laughs> I guess that's not really good. Um, yeah, but for me, it's become such a habit and it's so easy. I mean, I'm on my phone when I get out of work scrolling and I know what I like to see. So I, one, I like to show a lot of, you know, what we're doing in the service department. It makes us like humanize to our customers. You know, they see, you know, our shop foreman and how many years he's been here and that he's appreciated. I think, um, as a customer, I like seeing that. I want to go to a place where I know that the employees are taken care of. So we like to showcase that, that, you know, we take care of our employees here. We appreciate them. They are certified. They do all their training. We like to show like cool upfits we're doing or big engine jobs and just mm -hmm. showing more light to it. Um, the work we do with the community. Um, I think that's huge because people like to see that like, oh, wow. Um, you know, the Batera Auto Group, they care. They care about the city that they're in. They're helping students in schools. And, you know, other dealers are doing it that are successful. So I think you need to get on or you're going to be left in the dust, basically. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. And, and before before we move on to the others, I, I want to say, so when Felicia and I worked together, um, we kind of orchestrated this little takeover of, of the social media channels Yes, uh, because we didn't feel that they were being, they, they were, they, you know, there were, you know, sales of cars that were on there. There was, it was all stuff that we knew people didn't want to see. And so we managed to get ourselves added to the accounts and started posting stuff about the service department. Um, and, and kudos to you, Felicia, because you have kept it up. I've been, I've been out of that group for quite a few years now and, and you are still in there posting and, and keeping the service department at, at the forefront of people's minds. Well, yeah. and that's a good point because I think, you know, you guys saw an opportunity and most of the time the social media is managed by sales or is very sales focused. Um, and just giving anyone advice on like, you know, how do you take that over? Did you just go to them and say, Hey, <laughs> Like, yeah, pretty, or pretty much. <laughs> <laughs> hey, give that to me now. I it's, can do better. <laughs> so, so, yeah. so it's, it's developing relationships, which is what you have to do to, to take care of your customers, right? So mm -hmm. we, we develop a good relationship with the IT person who controls the passwords to the account. And yes. you get yourself put on the account. And then you just go from there and you sometimes you do things and ask, ask for forgiveness, for forgiveness later. later. Yeah, yeah. That's my favorite line. I usually, um, ask for forgiveness, not permission. So <laughs> I, <laughs> I don't know if that's good. <laughs> like, it, works for me, but. it could work. Yeah, um, it works. Uh, Gretchen. Okay. So you do a great job with your LinkedIn. Um, Thank you. I love, I love how you, um, you just tell stories so great and you like pull people in and some of it I feel like is, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Like, it's just so like, not intense, but it's like, it's like, it gets you thinking like, yeah. It's intense. Kaylee, it's intense. Yeah. Okay. Okay. It may be not intense for the reader, but sometimes it's, it's intense for me because there are things that I have shared that are so deeply personal to me and my journey in automotive, my journey as a woman, as a single mom, as like all those different things. So they're stories, Kaylee, like you said, they are absolutely stories of my life and putting that out there can be scary. But if you want to connect with people and to what Dave just said, right, that building the relationship so that you can kind of manage to get added to the account and take over, right? You have to have that. You, you have to put that out there. You can't, you can't be afraid to be vulnerable. And the first time I did it um, was with a post on a photo and the photo was in front of my car and it, it, it skyrocketed. It was almost, I think a year and a half ago. And I was absolutely overwhelmed at the amount of support that I got. And it was after that day, I was like, okay, wow, I can put myself out there. I can do this. Mm -hmm. So yeah, the word intense is absolutely the word. It's That's absolutely the word, but it's not being afraid to be vulnerable. And I want to note on um, something that Felicia said as well, like the community service part. I love that. I mean, for me, for LinkedIn to share with everyone out there, the work that I do with Junior Achievement of South Florida, with what I call automotive financial literacy, all those different things. And then to see dealerships doing that and putting out there because 
people, mm-hmm. customers, women want to connect with people at the dealership. Mm-hmm. That anybody can do an oil change. Anybody can, you know, replace air filters. But at the end of the day, I want to see the same person there. I love Felicia, the way that you highlight the people in your store and how long they've been there and all of, I know I'm going to see that person. Right. Mm -hmm. And that's so important. Those relationships are so important. It is. It it humanizes it. What you were saying is, you Mm -hmm. know, sharing people, sharing your stories, being vulnerable. That's how we connect. Um, You know, when you meet someone in person, you share stories about Mm -hmm. yourself. And, you know, of course, it's fearful to share stories or put yourself out there because there are going to be people that probably aren't very nice, but you just want them. You yeah. block them and oh, yeah. move on. <laughs> I, get, I get DMs all the time on with not so very nice things. And I just like, okay, great. I don't even block them because I figure, you know, if my story makes them upset in a kind of way, then okay, let them be upset. Right. Mm-hmm. But Kaylee, I feel like I know you. I feel like I know you and your 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 journey, your pregnancy, your your child, but I have never met you in person. Isn't that crazy? It's so I feel like I know you too. <laughs> yeah, exactly. But it's through those stories. And mm-hmm. I think it's wonderful. And thank you for the kind words because I feel the same about you when I read your posts as well. Oh, thank you. Um, but I want to get to Melissa too because you are you are um, a producer of a podcast. Mm-hmm. You guys are social. Yeah, so talk about that. How is that? Yeah, because you know our audience is different, right? So we, we struggled with where do we market ourselves with this whole new online, everything's online. We couldn't do Facebook. We're going more towards service managers and it's harder to connect with that on Facebook. Everybody uses that for a personal thing. Um, it, it, so we struggled. So how do we get our name out there? How do we market ourselves? And podcast it was. And it's been really great because it's not only put our name out there for clients, but also it's been a networking opportunity with other partners and other vendors um, that we've been able to partner up with. We've offered additional programs bringing on other vendors to piggyback off of the data that we give. Um, We're able to have a whole list of networking people that we're able to send to our customers if they're looking for additional help beyond our data. Um, But we wouldn't have been able to do any of that without the podcast. The podcast has opened it all up because it was just supposed to be a non-salesy, non-intellicheck type thing, but it really did meet us some great people. Oh yeah. Podcasting Mm -hmm. is huge in our industry because it's just that content and just talking about what's going on because there's just not a lot of content out there to help and people in the industry. So. Yeah. And, and 10 years ago, companies didn't converse with each other. We didn't meet companies right. that were almost considered um, maybe our rivals, right? Mm-hmm. But now we're having conversations with them and we're supporting one another on a podcast. Who, who knew that that was ever going to happen? Yeah, I, I think that's the biggest thing. The, the mm-hmm. biggest revolution that has come around from the podcasting is, num- number one, it gives you a chance to talk to amazing people. Yeah. Like if, if I had called all four of you and tried to get you onto a conference call at one time, it would (laughs) never happen. No. Right. But we can do it in this format. And, and so you get to talk to incredible people and, and to your point, uh, Melissa, it doesn't matter that, that you could even be a direct competitor, right? Mm -hmm. You can still have a great conversation around the industry and, and around what, what do you do? What do I do? How do we do it differently? How could we possibly work together to help each other, to help our customers? And those are conversations that didn't happen a few years ago. No, no. Uh, we have a whole list that we're putting on our website of, of other vendors that will help our clients with the data we give them. Because before we were just giving our clients this data and what are they doing with it? Do they know how to read it? They know how to get the best out of it. Yeah. Uh, now here I have I have all these these people that can help you with that. And it's just better for our clients. Right. The more the more you support one another in the industry, it's better for everyone. It is. Yeah. I I mean, I know for me hosting, I feel like I learn so much by doing my interviews. Like the audience learns, but I learn way more (laughs) by Mm -hmm. doing by doing the interviews. Um, Yeah. 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 There is a whole parts of the industry I knew nothing about until the podcast. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. And the other cool part too, is you almost kind of feel like a celebrity. Like you feel like when you're doing the interviews, it almost feels like you're famous, you know, cause almost before it was like only famous people did podcasts. Now anyone can do a podcast. 
<laughs> yeah, I'm more behind the scenes with it, so I don't feel so famous. But yeah, <laughs> so Brandon, our host, yeah, he's famous in my he's eyes. He's famous, yeah. <laughs> um, oh man. So okay. Melissa, you brought up uh, you you brought up data, mm -hmm. uh, data, data. However, you pronounce that. I'm, yes. I'm, I'm from Massachusetts, so. Yeah, how do you pronounce um, it? Data? Data. Uh, data. I say data. That's yeah, what data. I say. Data. Data. Okay. Data. okay. We're all on the same page. Okay. <laughs> um, so what what would you what what would you say the the dealerships and and I I, I want to ask each one of you this because each one of you has a different perspective on on the data itself. So what what type of data do you find most useful for a dealership? Um, and I'm gonna start in the middle with Gretchen. So you, as as a consultant, um, mm -hmm. you're going in and 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 that's initially that's what you have to look at is data before you mm -hmm. get to a store. Oh, so yeah. so how how are you using data to to look at stores? I'm starting with their customer experience because I want to understand what they're delivering to their customers before I look at operational processes, before I talk to anybody. So it's those KPIs, those benchmarks around CSI and actually seeing if I can dive into their CRM a little bit and really pull some reports out of there. Because for me, that's the most important thing to find out before someone in the dealership says to me, oh, well, we need to fix this. We have to fix this. It's like, but do you, right? Is that mm -hmm. what the data is telling us? Are we actually making data-driven decisions? I'm with you, Melissa. I'm a complete data nerd. Um, give me a spreadsheet with 100,000 lines mm -hmm. of data and where I can just cross over and call, oh, oh, mm, 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 mm. <laughs> 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 I'm, I, I'm just like, oh, I'm just, I'm going to mute. Hold on. Hold on, Kaylee. I'm going to mute myself, Dave, because it don't get me going on the, on, on the conversation around data nerds. All right. And, uh, but Melissa, we'll go, we'll go to you next. Yeah. Well, of course the, you know, the data that I give to clients is the one that I'm going to promote. Uh, we give pricing data, right. Knowing what their competition is, is doing. Uh, we call around to their competition. We let them know what their prices are, you know, what the competition is telling your customers when they're calling around. We also do customer service evaluations. You know, what are your service advisors telling a customer? You can be standing in your service department listening to your advisor talk on the phone, but when you walk out, how are they really answering they call those calls? Are they, you know, quoting the right prices? Are they trying to get that client to come in for a for an appointment? Um, that's I think those are the two things: your pricing data, your local market, and your customer service that you're giving out are the three most important things. Mm -hmm. All right. And now Felicia, the in-store. Yes. So CSI, definitely CSI is uh, basically seeing what the customers are saying, where we're lacking. Um, I don't know if I need to implement any policies or if things aren't being done unless I look at that. You know, I can see where are we for FFE, um, our follow-up, where do we compare to this area, to the U.S.? Um, as far as ROEM is considered. And they have, our survey um, is very lengthy, but it does break it down where I can look at all the indicators to see what we're lacking in. Um, whether it's updating a customer, um, you know, thoroughness of the work completed, anything like that. So it really breaks it down. So we, I look at that daily and obviously I like my financial statements. Um, we have Reynolds and Reynolds, so I do a lot of, I can see any report down to the nitty gritty effective labor rate hours per row, um, you know, the report card analysis report, seeing what technicians are recommending, what they're not recommending down to the operation code. That's what I love doing that. Um, I don't know about Excel sheets with a hundred lines, but give me like a report from Reynolds and I love it. You know, um, I want to look at every single thing and toggle between which technician, which advisor, what operations not being done. And that's the only system I've ever used. So I just love, like I, I know in and out, I love it. And that's where I'm always looking to see and uncover what is being hidden because, you know, humans like to hide things. <laughs> yeah. And, and there is no hiding from, from the data. No. <laughs> digging into those things, right? There, there's, yeah. there, there, you can listen to a technician tell you that 
my recommendations per vehicle are down because you, the dispatcher gives me all new vehicles mm -hmm. and you can pull up that, that multi-point inspection report to show the, the tech that actually the average mileage on the last 20 cars that you worked on was 87,212 miles. Yep. You didn't get all new cars, <laughs> right? So no, what's really going on? And, and really we kind of dig down there a little further. Yes. And for a parts perspective too, a tech, you know, going like, you need to stock these parts. Okay. I stocked them. They're still sitting here. <laughs> now they're obsolete. Thank you. <laughs> oh man. We could go on and on about data. Oh yeah. <laughs> so stick, stick with data. And what are, what are the advantages of knowing and understanding the, the data that, that you do have available to you? Uh, and Felicia, we'll, we'll stick with you on this. Um, I would say you stay ahead of the curve. Uh, you can see trends. You can fix things. Um, and I'm a proponent for data, but being in the dealership, I will s do a plug. And uh, I'm also, you have to be on the floor with your people. You know, you have to be in the shop. You have to be on the counter because data is great, but it's sometimes after the fact, right? So I like to look at my data, but then also spend time, you know, at least an hour every day on the counter with the advisors, walking around the shop, seeing what they're actually doing. So I do think um, data is great if you're looking at it, um, but also you need to be involved um, if you're in the dealership, you know, like I am actually seeing what they're doing. Um, so you can maybe stop things before they, you know, becomes a trend. Yeah. So it's, it's leading and lagging metrics, right? You, you yes, need to, exactly. the, the, the data is going to give you what, what did happen, but yes. because you're out there on the desk, in the service drive, in the shop, you're, you're kind of seeing things uh, hopefully ahead of that data showing you that something bad happened. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Melissa. That's what makes Felicia a great leader, right? Being on the floor, not just looking at the data. That and there's not many leaders that do that. So yeah, I, you know the data gives you what you. Uh, it, it helps you and you know make informed decisions. It optimizes mm -hmm. your performance. The data is there for a reason. So understanding it and using it is what's going to make you succeed. Yep. Yeah, Gretchen, round us out. Round us out. For me, it even um, with my experience with uh, TPAs, OEMs, it's that risk management. So looking at the data actually helps me like identify those potential risks and being like, okay, what do we have to do to proactively get around this so we don't fall into this chasm? And then Melissa, you had said something earlier to the um, competition, right? Mm -hmm. So it's that competitive advantage. Mm -hmm. If I look at the data, it's like, what is, what is happening here? What opportunities do we have? So not only to mitigate risk, but to uncover opportunities in which we can move forward and get past our competition that we may not even know about because we don't understand the data and we don't have people there to actually read it properly. Yeah. That's a great point. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. I kind right. of that all the time, Dave. They're like, we have all this data, but what do we do with it? I'm like, exactly. Give it to me. Let me look. <laughs> and the competitor advantage, I'm surprised how many people I've spoke to that said, I, I don't care what my competition is doing. It doesn't matter to me. And that shocks me because hmm. your Customers are, especially nowadays, and the prices are going skyrocketing. People are calling around. Don't you want to know? Don't you want to have the confidence to know what your competition is doing, what they're telling your customers when they call around? Yeah. Mm -hmm. I, I think that's a that's a social media thing, right? Because the, yeah. the influencers are going to tell you, you don't worry about the competition. You worry about you. Mm -hmm. You absolutely have to worry about the competition. That's, yeah. That's, that's great in the gym, right? Yeah. Or Or when you're you're cooking or something. I don't need to worry about what anybody else is doing, but mm -hmm. uh, when I'm in business, I kind of need to know what somebody else is doing. And I think it's, it's Russell with Fix Apps Marketing always says you have, they have to drive by 16 different stores before they get to your dealership. And what are the chances you're not going to stop at one of those 16? Yep. You, Melissa, that's such a great point because the data will actually tell us exactly what dealerships they drive by what their habits are and oh i don't know how we should actually know what our competition is doing in order to capture that customer back into our ama mm -hmm. yep yeah <laughs> that's uh it, it needs to not even even matter what dealerships they're driving by if, if you're if you are paying attention 
mm -hmm. uh, and then delivering the message back to those customers, yeah. um, then those those dealerships are not even there to them, right? They, right. They're going from, from their destination to your destination. Mm -hmm. and they're not concerned with anything else. Exactly. Um, yeah. I can tell you when I'm headed for ice cream at Dairy Queen, I don't see anything else. I go buy a lot of things. I don't see anything else. <laughs> I'm headed for ice cream. Yeah. So I see a hard scoop. Okay. Yeah. It comes uh, well, full circle to our previous conversation, right? If you have transparency and communication yes. and consistency, mm -hmm. they're going to keep coming back to you. Yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. And, and Gretchen, so da Dairy Queen, it, I don't know how far out in the country they go. It's soft serve. <laughs> it's uh, all, it, isn't it all soft serve? It's all soft serve. Yeah. Yeah. I, um, I was able to go to Mr. Hendricks Dairy Queen within um, the museum. It was amazing. But here in South Florida, we don't have it. We just have to go to Costco for $2. <laughs> you get a big old soft serve. Like the cup is this big. It's ridiculous. It's not, it's wonderful though. It's wonderful. Costco I may, soft I may start good. driving down there to get ice cream then. <laughs> Dairy Queen used to have um hard or what is it called? What did we just call it? Hard scoop? Hard, yeah, yeah, like a hard like yeah. Yeah, I I years ago I used to used work to in an ice cream that. parlor. So yeah, it was like the the hard scoop through 30 flavors, Baskin Robbins. <laughs> Me too, Gretchen. <laughs> yes. I was meant to scoop school with Baskin Robbins. Yes. <laughs> They have scoop school. <laughs> they have scoop school. Yes. Yeah. And, and that's the school you have to go to for like a yeah. week. You yeah. got to learn. You got to learn how to scoop it properly. It rolls, you know. Yeah. You can't just gouge into that ice cream. No. I was an ice cream girl as well, but it was at a local oh, shop. Really? So that was my first job. I that means it. you know how to make a milkshake. <laughs> I do. And waffle cones. We used to make our own waffle cones. So. Yes. Yeah. Oh, I want ice cream. Yeah, all the things hungry. people thought they were going to learn today, I don't think that was it. <laughs> we're going to teach you how to scoop ice cream. <laughs> I did not. That was not my first job. I did not work with ice cream, but I did sandwiches. Oh, okay. Go. Even better. Yep. Even yeah, better. I love sandwiches. There's definitely the same here. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Haley was a sandwich artist. Yeah. Right? Isn't that what they called yeah. the Subway That's people what they back then? Yep. Subway. I think they yep. still do call them sandwich art because yeah. yep. it is an art. Yeah. yeah. That was my wife's to... first job was Subway. So. Really? I didn't know yeah. that. Or maybe yeah, I did know that. Yeah, no, you probably didn't. I don't, I didn't. I don't think I've ever said that. Pile everything. But, but they make yeah, it there's... different now. They don't, they don't, like, they used to cut the middle of the bread out. The, yeah. Now they, now they oh. don't. No, they so. don't. But they have the hinge cut now, and, and you have to layer the, it's, there's a certain formula so that yeah. it closes, and a lot of people don't follow it. That's why I hate going to something. Yeah. They don't, they don't right. let you see the meat anymore. There's, like, they cover it, so you can't see the meat. I don't oh, know. No. Yeah, why did they do that? I don't know. <laughs> yeah, I'll get back to Jersey Mike's, Mike's at this point. I'm like, I just go to Jersey Mike's because they've got the hinge cut. They do the thing. Oh, and Jersey it, Mike's is the best. All like mm -hmm. we're, we're talking sandwiches. Jersey Mike's is my favorite. Uh, I swear <laughs> all the way. Yes. <laughs> I think it's lunchtime. <laughs> all right. Now we're gonna get away from sandwiches and ice cream and get back to the show. Uh Kaylee, guess what time it is? It is weekly stat time. Yes. The statistic of the week brought to you by Parts Edge. And this week, it says women make up only 12.1 of automotive repair and maintenance roles, according to the Bureau of Labor and Statistics. And now that statistic is across uh, dealerships and independent repairs, not, not, uh, not just dealerships. That's across all repair and, and maintenance shops. Either way, it is a horrendously low uh, number uh, mm -hmm. for, for us to have. And so our last segment is how do we open this industry up to, to more women? Um, and I'm going to, I'm going to read this. Mary Barra, who is CEO of GM right now, uh, worked in several different areas of the company before she became the CEO. Um, so how do we get those opportunities for women in the dealership. Um, Gretchen, you mentioned you had to really fight to, to get yourself to that F&I office. Um, yeah. Alicia, yeah. you had to fight to get yourself to that service manager, service director role. Um, Melissa, you have come from the, the bottom up to almost the top role in your, in your company. And actually I would, I would say the COO is the actual top role. The CEO is the, well, you're, you. you're, the, you're the one making the CEO look good. Yeah. <laughs> we, so, won't, we won't say that to her. 
<laughs> operations is it. Operations it. That's it. Hard stop. Operations. <laughs> so, uh, starting starting with you, Melissa. What what do you what do you think are some of the things that that we need to do to to start making this this industry inviting for women to want to join and and want to work in? Well, I think shows like this do the trick, right? Bring awareness and visibility to other women that are doing it and succeeding at it and enjoying it. I mean, I think it's safe to say we all enjoy our roles very much and it shows by the way we talk about it. So if you can make it more uh, visible to other women and make it look like they can do it. Yeah, that, that that's that's certainly part of it, right? Is is we mm -hmm. have to we we have to put it on the the options board. We just yeah. talked a ton about food, right? This automotive needs to be on the menu board of careers for women to choose from when right. when when they're trying to decide what to do. Mm -hmm. yep. And I think going Go ahead, to schools and doing and a lot of what Gretchen is doing is yeah. And talk talk about that, Gretchen, because <laughs> yeah. I think that's huge. Mm -hmm. You're muted, Gretchen. Oh, she's muted. I, you know, I muted from earlier, Dave. I told you. I'll just get going. Um, yeah, no, Kaylee, you're absolutely correct. So for That's me, cool. like there's so much work being done within the dealerships, within things like this with podcasts and conferences, conventions, all those different items that I have chosen to take my time and I go to the schools. So I work with middle schools and high schools, and there is nothing more fulfilling than going in for a career day or working with them on mentoring, you know, young ladies and having conversations, talking about automotive financial literacy, which is that series I just got done with Kaylee and having the young ladies come up to me afterwards, 15, 16 years old and being like, how do I do what you do? I want to do what you do. And I'm like, you do? Okay, right. Oh, that, all right. Yeah, let's talk about that. Um, and exposing, you know, young girls and young ladies to what the automotive industry can be. And that you, it's not, it's not, it's unfortunately not a, 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 a large barrier to get into, right? I came in as a title clerk, right, Felicia, you would come in as a greeter, you know, a lot of the young ladies that I work with are from um, a different SES. So it's important to make sure that those things are offered and that the trades are understood. So that's where technician work comes in as well, because we need more female technicians. We need to load the bench. Our talent pool is shallow right now, and we know it. So going into the schools and doing that type of work, really, it just makes my heart happy because I know that I am molding that future of women in automotive, even though it might be five years, 10 years down the road, I have a more of a futuristic mindset to say, okay, let's build the bench and let's do it now, right? Within the schools. Absolutely. Yeah. And and Gretchen, you so so another another stat within that already small percentage of mm -hmm. women that are in the, the automotive industry, 12% mm -hmm. uh, of those of that small group already is uh, our female technicians. Mm. Uh, so, so you take an already small number in the, in the, the yeah. 1.2 million people that are employed in automotive yeah. um, and reduce that down to 12% of technicians. I don't even know how many technicians are in, in the United States, but yeah, it's, um, it, it's amazing. It's amazing working with the young ladies and explaining to them like all the different opportunities available in automotive outside of the dealership and just in so many areas. Yeah. And I think that's part we, of the problem. So, sorry, go ahead, Kayla. No, that's okay. I was just going to say, how do we get those electives back into the high schools? Because when I was in high school, we had a body shop, we had medals, and I took it because I didn't want to take calculus. <laughs> so <laughs> mm -hmm. I knew I wanted trade. So, I mean, obviously I didn't become a welder, but um, that, like, how do we do that? Because I'm pretty sure the high school I went to doesn't have those programs anymore. Mm -hmm. There is, um, I know Junior Achievement of South Florida, the Junior Achievements, they support the trades. Um, a friend of mine I was speaking to the other day, he just uh, partnered with Winata, right, up in Washington, right, for the trades. It feels like that might be a little too far for, you know, down the road, we need to pull it forward, right? But having having dealerships, automotive, fixed ops people partnering with those schools and, and creating those programs, this, the automotive schools are out there. Tech schools are out there. They want to partner, it's just interesting to me that more large dealer groups don't get as involved as they should. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Felicia to round it out. 
Hello. Um, so I also do work with um, high schools, not middle schools, but we do a co-op with three different trade schools in the area. And I think I've had six students so far. One of them was a female. So that was amazing. And I had her for about a year and a half. And now she's working not at a, not here, um, but she knows an, somebody who has a, their own shop. So that's where she's working. She's still a technician, which is awesome. But I do think um, there's so when I go to the trade schools, one of them in particular is really great as far as they run it just like a like a dealership per se, like a service department where they have somebody working like a parts counter and they call for parts and they have like a writer. And and that's what I think needs to be discussed more in the schools is that it's not just technicians, because I feel like at trade schools, yep. it's like be a technician. But there's right. no like there's parts advisors, right? There's service advisors, there's finance managers, there's salesmen, saleswomen, like there's so many different avenues that are never discussed that I see personally. Um, I didn't know anything. You know, when I came in here, I didn't know there was all these jobs at a dealership. Like I had no idea that there were so many moving bodies and so many different opportunities here. And so it did take my dealership. It took a while of me persuading them, like, let's get involved in co-ops. And the reason they didn't want to is just the risk factor, right? They're young, they're young children and things can happen and insurances and vehicles and stuff like that. But now we've been doing it now for about three years and it's been, it's an amazing part of my job. I love going there. You know, I go to their senior nights, I watch them graduate. If they stay with me long enough and they have, like I've had more success than failures in it. And mm -hmm. I, see other dealerships in the area and, you know, they're like, Oh, I don't want to do it. You know, it's just, it's a lot of work and it is, but I, I have more of the mindset of like down in the future. Right. And I, yeah, and I do think that women are more nurturing and, you know, as far as I can take the time with them and I don't have a problem, like if it doesn't work out or sitting and talking with them, like molding their future. Right. A lot of the students that I've come across, they don't even have, uh, parents really that are involved in their life. So it's nice to be able to provide a place for them to feel comfortable, for them to learn, for them to grow and hopefully have this as a career, whether it's a technician or here or somewhere else, or if it's a, a writer, you know, we have one student that's now a parts advisor and he's like running the whole back counter and he's amazing, you know? And so I think we just need to talk about it more and get involved in the schools, but also share that there's more than just technicians. There's other jobs you can do in a dealership. Uh, there's a lot of moving parts and we need, we all need each other for it to work. So yeah. I would say definitely that in podcasts like this, like I, when I go to a OEM training, I'm usually the only woman there, you know, there might be one other woman out of 50. So I don't see a lot of women. Uh, I don't interact with a lot of women that are in the automotive industry. It's usually, you know, just me and a couple other women, <laughs> but so this is awesome. This is amazing. It makes me feel not alone. Um, you know, it's, it's hard to, I'm not a single mom, but I have three kids and to do this and to be a manager and all, it's just a, di it's different. You know, I am different than the average male in the automotive industry. So this has been amazing. So thank you all. It was great to hear you all. And I hope more women will join automotive industry in whatever, you know, job position it looks like for them. Yeah. I, I think your, your point is well taken about women being more nurturing and you're taking that from the standpoint of being able to nurture that relationship with people coming into the industry. But even women as service advisors, at, as parts advisors, they, they're more nurturing with the customers. Um, they, they're also typically much more methodical than <laughs> us squirrel brain men. Um, and, and so in, in a parts department, a, a woman on the parts counter typically can work through an issue of rather than just that's uh, not in stock, they can work through an issue and, and actually, you know, figure out like, oh, but we still have to fix a customer's car and can methodically <laughs> take you through that um, as, as opposed to, to us who just go, it's not in stock. And, get and get we'll out of my on. face. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> this that order. yeah. A woman as a dispatcher is incredible. I mean, that's, mm -hmm. yes. yeah. Yep. Perfect. Perfect uh, thing. And, and you're absolutely right. The, the women need to know that there are way more jobs in automotive other than salesperson at the front of the house or technician in the back mm -hmm. there there's i don't even know how many positions if i had to guess i would say there were 30 different positions in your average dealership um that that somebody could could work at and mm -hmm. and you know for all different skill levels um all different interests whether whether 
you're a, a, a Gretchen data nerd that wants to just stare at spreadsheets, um, you know, it, it doesn't matter what, what you actually want to do. You can find it within the dealership. Yeah. Um, so Felicia, Gretchen, Melissa, thank you so much for being our guest today. Uh, Kaylee, thank you for being my co-host. Uh, it was absolutely amazing having you all here. Uh, I know everybody watching got a uh, great education. For anybody who did miss the show or who wants to watch it again, it is available on demand. Uh, you, you can reach out to anybody here for a, a link on demand. And it will also be replayed Tuesday night at 8 p.m. Uh, Eastern Standard Time, uh, again, as, as a LinkedIn event. So you'll be able to just sign up there and you, you can watch it again there. Uh, again, thank you, everybody, uh, for being here. Uh, we truly appreciate your time. And we will see you. I won't see you on a recorded thing on Tuesday, but I will see you live next Thursday. Thanks, everybody. Bye. Thank you. Thank you.